morning, Creekside family. We are the Middle Steps. Mike. Antonia. Abby. Avery. And Emma. For the past few months, it's felt like we've been stuck in a never-ending game of two truths and a lie. Every current event has differing and opposing views, not to mention endless opinions. How do we know who to believe and what to trust? We filter it through God's word. Kingdoms rise and fall, people come and go, perspectives change, but God's word stands forever. Here's a verse of encouragement from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please stand and let's worship together.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious.
If you are new and would like more information about Creekside, please click on the New Here link on our website. All kids can find this week's Sunday School lesson on our Facebook page or website. Creekside is now holding outdoor in-person services on our patio at 9 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. on Sundays. If you would like to attend, please make sure you register beforehand at creeksidecommunity.org slash in-person services. Creekside, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us for our digital service. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, One quick announcement before we begin. I think 2020 uh, will be remembered as a year in which our nation reckoned, uh, grappled with this issue of of police brutality and more broadly with America's history of racial justice. And, And so I've been asking, okay, how does God speak to such matters in his word? How should followers of Jesus approach these issues. Uh, Recently, I had the privilege of sitting down with longtime Creekside elder George McQuillister and Pastor James Westbrook of the Realm Church in Oakland, who we are supporting, and was able to have a really helpful conversation and and wrestle with these questions of race and justice and uh, life together in the family of God and, and what it all means. And so we're giving them to you as a resource, and you can find them at the link right below here. I pray these conversations would be helpful to you, clarifying to you, and to think biblically about these matters, and that they would stimulate us to love and good deeds as we think about how to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God. I also want to thank you for um, your patience in waiting for these. I know I announced this several months ago that we'd wanted to have these conversations, but lining up schedules and people and capturing content and editing. It all took a little longer than we expected. So thank you for waiting. I really appreciate it. And I'd again, hope they would benefit you as those conversations were, were of great benefit to me. Let's pray as we go to God's word this morning. Jesus, you are the light of the world. You reveal God to us. You also reveal us to ourselves. You show us our need for you, so would we embrace that exposing light? Would we walk in your light? Show us our need. Show us your great provision. And we walk closely with you all the days of our lives. For you promise, Lord, that the one who believes in you will not walk in darkness, but has the light of life. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. As a kid, one of my favorite places to visit was the Exploratorium over in San Francisco. And to this day, my favorite exhibit at the Exploratorium is the Tactile Dome. You ever been in the dome? It's, uh, it's terrifying. It's a, it's a maze, but it is pitch black. You cannot see. It's a, a great place to injure yourself or to scare other people or to awkwardly bump into strangers. It's, it's really fun. Uh, but, but here's the thing about the dome. If you want to get through it, you cannot rely on your own sight. You, you think your eyes still work when you get in there, but they really don't. And the harder you try to use your eyes, the harder you try to see, the, the harder a time you're going to have navigating your way through the dome. And in a sense, the only way to see is to admit that you can't. 
And once you do that, you begin to rely on your other senses, particularly on your sense of touch, and then you, you actually have a much better sense of your surroundings. The Christian life is, is filled with these paradoxes. If you want to experience life, you must die to yourself. If you want to be hum- exalted, you have to embrace humility. And, as we'll see today, if you want to see, you must admit that you're blind. If you want to live in reality, if you want life God's way, it starts when, when I acknowledge that, that I'm blind and I can't see clearly without Jesus' help. Today we're looking at the ninth chapter of John's Gospel. This entire chapter revolves around one miracle, Jesus' healing of a man born blind. But in John's gospel, miracles are never just miracles. They're symbols, which is why John calls them signs. A sign is something that points beyond itself to a greater truth, to a deeper reality. So what's the deeper reality, the greater truth, that this miracle reveals about Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is found back in chapter 8. In chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said this, that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus, in chapter 9, gives literal light to a blind man's eyes to demonstrate that he is the light of the world. What does that mean? Well, first, it means that we cannot see God clearly apart from Jesus. Jesus is the climactic revelation of God. So Jesus is a light that reveals God to us, but Jesus is also a light that reveals us to us. Jesus, when he comes to earth, exposes our true condition. At the end of chapter 9, Jesus says it like this, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Jesus' purpose in coming to earth is not to condemn us in judgment, it's to save us. That's his purpose in coming to the world. And yet, the result of Jesus coming into this world is a kind of judgment. How? Well, when Jesus comes into the world, it exposes the true condition of people's hearts. And Jesus says there are two kinds of people in the world. There are some who recognize they are blind and that they need him to see. On the other hand, there are those who claim to see and thereby demonstrate that they are blind. Some people say, I can't figure out life. I need help. I run to Jesus and Jesus shows me what I need and how to live. Then there are people who go, I've got it. I already have this figured out, Jesus, and thereby demonstrate that they are blind. That's the judgment that Jesus affects by his coming. He divides humanity into two camps. Those who know they're blind so they can see and those who think they can see and thereby prove they are blind. Now, when Jesus says this, there are some religious leaders, some Pharisees, within earshot. These people reject Jesus, but they overhear what he says and they they respond with, with, with sarcasm. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? These men have already rejected Jesus, and they ask, you don't really think we're blind, do you? They can't imagine that that Jesus would accuse them of having spiritual blindness, of not understanding God's ways or seeing him clearly. Jesus responds like this, and and this is really the take-home point of chapter 9, verse 41. If you were blind, you would have no guilt, But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus flips this question back on them. If these Pharisees were truly blind in the sense that Jesus is talking about, if they admitted their need for Jesus and said, I'm blind, I need your help to see, then they would come to Jesus for help. And they wouldn't have guilt. Their guilt would be removed. But because they claim to see, 
to have things already figured out and reject Jesus. Now that they've rejected Jesus, they've proven that they're blind, and now they're without excuse. If you admit that you can't see, Jesus will help you see. If you don't admit that, then you can't see at all. And so the danger for us is not that we would realize how blind we are, but that we would presume that we can already see. That's what keeps us from living in reality, keeps us from seeing our need for Jesus and living in his light and in his love. Is this blindness that comes from presuming we already have sight. And to one degree or another, everyone in this passage has a kind of blindness. The religious leaders, the crowds, even Jesus' disciples exhibit blindness. And so the question for us is, what keeps us from seeing Jesus and seeing life clearly? Two, two blind spots I want to talk about today. Two ways we presume to see that blind us from seeing our need for Jesus. The first blind spot is a kind of moral superiority. I'm better than other people. Second is a kind of intellectual superiority. These are both forms of pride. They're both forms of presumption that we already have things figured out. And they are two things that keep us from seeing Jesus clearly and seeing life clearly. Let's look at each of these more closely. The first blind spot we can have that keeps us from seeing our need for Jesus is moral superiority. It's been interesting during COVID to see the ways that people react to these various laws and regulations that are put in place. And it's been interesting for me to see how I react in my own heart. You know, I'll be honest, uh, months and months ago, when the mask mandate first went into effect, I wasn't always the most diligent mask wearer. It was a new habit. I'd never done it before. First, I'm like, boy, this is really restrictive. It's kind of weird. And, and to be honest, I forgot to bring my mask some places. And so I'd go, okay, whoops, put on the mask, no big deal. But, you know, a few days later, I had a change of heart. I realized this is an important thing. Got to wear the mask. I put on the mask. I'm a dutiful mask wearer now. And, you know, the minute that I made the decision to be the dutiful mask wearer, I started looking at people who didn't wear the mask differently. I thought, you know, that's really risky what you're doing. Oh, gosh, that, that person doesn't have a mask on. What are they, what are they thinking? And, and it's hilarious, right? Because how quickly I condemn someone for doing the very same thing I was doing five minutes earlier. When I wasn't wearing a mask, I had a big deal. But well, now, now that I'm doing it, oh, now I feel this moral superiority to other people. And it shows that there's this innate tendency to figure out how I am better than other people why other people's actions are worse. And that moral superiority, that need to build yourself up and push other people down, is something that blinds us from our need for Jesus. The text says this, verse 1, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's a logical fallacy known as the, the false alternative. When your kids come to you and say, Dad, I need ice cream or I'm going to die. What is that? That's a, a false alternative. Those, there's more options than that. It's not like either you eat ice cream or you die. No, there's, there's a third option, right? You don't eat ice cream and you don't die and you're happy about it and you don't complain, right? That's the, the option we want as parents. But the false alternative this idea that there are only two options when there are more. That, that's what the disciples think here. They associate sin with suffering, and they do so so intimately that they look at a man born blind and they assume this person must have done something wrong to be born blind. This must be some kind of punishment from God for something this person did. Or it must be something the parents did. But either way, someone must have screwed up. This must be some kind of punishment from God. That's the reason people suffer, because they screw up. It's very similar to Job's friends in the Old Testament. When Job begins to suffer, they go for chapters on end. Okay, there must be something wrong you're doing, and that's why you're suffering. 
What is it, Jesus? Did this guy sin or did his parents? Jesus has an entirely different view of the situation. In effect, he says, <laughs> false. Wrong choices. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am uh, the light of the world. The disciples are focused on whose fault it is that this person is suffering. Jesus is focused on God's mission to send him to alleviate this suffering and display who he is. See, Jesus doesn't even get in to the whole why bad things happen to people here thing exactly. He, he says, it was neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God. And I think what he's saying is that the result of this thing will be that the works of God are displayed in him. Jesus doesn't get into speculation about why these things are happening, but he says the result of this thing will be that God is glorified. Jesus is focused on the urgency of the mission. He says, right now it's day. In other words, this is my ministry. This is my mission. This is my time to reveal myself to the world. Night is coming. In other words, Jesus is saying, there is a time when I will not be doing the works of God. I'm going to die on the cross. I will be taken away from you. But right now I'm in the world. I'm displaying the Father's works. I'm focused on his mission. And people have a limited time to see who I am and respond. Jesus is so focused on his mission of revealing himself to the world. Jesus is focused on showing compassion to this person, which was the Father's will here. This is so encouraging because often when we are in suffering, we ask this question, why? Why do bad things happen? Was it something I did? But what Jesus can assure us here of is this, that God always is working redemptively, not just in spite of our suffering, but through our suffering. That yes, bad things happen. Yes, we don't always know why. But also God has all of those things enfolded into his redemptive purpose and they are not wasted. They are not wasted. It's such an encouragement when we're suffering to just know that God isn't surprised. And God is working in this to glorify himself. Right now we're fostering a little guy named Omari. Omari has had a lot of health challenges in his short life. Now I don't think any of them are his fault. At all. But it's, it's hard. There's blood sugar level things. There's neurological things. It's hard on this little guy. And the comfort comes nigh. And I'm going to know exactly why all of this happened. But that God is using this right now to glorify himself and is absolutely sovereign in this and has a redemptive purpose that the works of God are going to be displayed in this little guy's life through the things that he's wrestling through right now. This is what Jesus does with our hardship, with our pain. That's what he's doing here. He is out to heal this person and to use the suffering as a platform to showcase God's redemptive power. But the way Jesus does this is interesting. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus demonstrates that he is the light of the world. How? By giving this man sight. But what does Jesus do? He, he spits. He makes mud. He, he sends the person to wash in a pool, which would have demonstrated that he was ritually pure and also healed of his disease to everyone there. But, but why the mud? Jesus clearly has the power to heal people simply by speaking a word. Remember John 5? He says to the paralytic, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Why doesn't Jesus just say, see? Why does he do this? Well, I think one clue as to why Jesus heals in this way is found down in verse 14, where we read, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. 
Jesus performs this miracle on the Sabbath. Apparently, Jesus just loved doing miracles on the Sabbath because he always seems to end up doing them on those days. But the religious leaders in Israel had created extensive rules and regulations around the Sabbath. This, God said, was a day of rest. You couldn't work. And so the Jews created this elaborate oral tradition in which they defined work, all of the things that you could not do on the Sabbath. And and there were 39 categories of things you couldn't do, and one of them is that there was no kneading allowed. You could not knead bread. You couldn't moisten flour with water and transform it into bread. So, so if you're on Pinterest and showing all the amazing bread you're baking, you couldn't do that on the Sabbath. So, so what does Jesus do? He does something that's pretty provocative. He, he gets down in the mud and he makes this kneading motion. He moistens the dirt with his spit and he kind of works it together. And so it's intentionally provocative. Why would he do that? Well, now the Pharisees are forced to, to make a decision about Jesus. Is he really breaking the Sabbath? Does that count? As breaking the Sabbath? Is that a needing motion? See, Jesus is challenging them to challenge their own assumptions about what it means to obey the law and what is most important because they think they see clearly and understand the law, but but Jesus wants to show them that they're blind. And now we'll we'll get back to that in a moment. But Jesus performs this this miracle and, and, and there's a great commotion and great confusion among the people who see this man who can now see. Verse 8 says, The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is not this, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and and said to me, Go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. The crowd is confused. You see, blindness is always operating at two levels in this passage. There's the physical blindness of the man, and then there's this spiritual blindness and different degrees of spiritual blindness among all of the people. And the crowd, it's clear, they're confused. They, they can't see what's happening clearly. Some of them are saying, no, this is really the guy. And other people are saying, that's not him. That's someone else. That, that couldn't have happened. And it's hilarious because as the crowd is having this dispute, it's almost as if the, the guy is standing there in the background like, hey, guys, it's, it's, it's me. It really, it really is. And, and so finally they realize that and go, okay, well, well, how did this happen? Who is this person? They look for Jesus. Jesus isn't there. They're still not seeing Jesus, and they're still not seeing him clearly. There's there's confusion going on about what happened. Now, rather than go try to find Jesus, it it seems that the crowd is more concerned about the man and, and whether he did anything wrong. Verse 13 says, They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, they're amazed at what's happened to these people. They're confused. But, but why would they bring them to the Pharisees? It's not entirely clear. But, but here's, here's what seems to be going on. They, they want the, the officials of the law, the legal experts, to, to hear about what happened. Because it happened on the Sabbath. This man was, was part of this event. And they want to make sure that, that he didn't do anything wrong either. They're hesitant, right? Did, did Jesus do something wrong by making, kneading the, the, the mud? And, and, and was this man an accomplice to that? And, and they're treating him the way they're leading him here, almost like they're putting him on trial. See, see what you see throughout this passage is this sense of moral superiority among people. The disciples display it. The crowds implicitly do it. The the Pharisees explicitly show this moral superiority in the way they talk to this man. And moral superiority, the sense that that there are really bad people in the world, it's just that I'm not one of them, is something that blinds us to Jesus. How? Well, if you are acutely aware of other people's failures and shortcomings, 
and not your own. You begin to think that, that Jesus' forgiveness and mercy is grace. Ultimately, it's something that other people really need. But it's not for me. It's not something I really need. And, and if I have that sense of moral superiority, I'm not interested in finding out more about Jesus, his direction, his guidance, his grace, because I just think I've got my stuff together. I don't really need him. How do you know if you, you exhibit that kind of moral superiority? That you just don't really see your need for Jesus' direction or his help? Here's a few questions I would ask. and The first one is, is this. Is my instinct to associate tragedy, calamity, with failure? Something terrible happens to someone. They have a sickness. They lose their job. There's a divorce. <sighs> They have a, a kid who, who gets addicted to something. Is your instinct to grieve? Or is your, your instinct to ask, okay, what did they do wrong? There's got to be someone to blame. Is that your instinct when you see tragedy? It's either, okay, the government's got to be to blame, or this person, or that party, or, or whatever. We have to figure out who to blame because anytime anything goes wrong, there's someone to blame. <laughs> I, I, I know a person who says, we can't have closure until we find someone to blame. Right? There's this sense that if something is wrong, I've just got to find out who did it, where society went wrong, where someone went wrong. Something screwed up to create this, this, this situation. See, and if that's your mentality, that you look at things and go, well, someone must have done something wrong somewhere. Right? It's this assumption that, well, I have my stuff together because I do things right. That's why I'm doing fine. Are you able to just realize that sometimes there are just tragedies and calamities and there's mystery in the world and we don't always know why things happen? And sometimes the, the, the point is to just grieve and not to find someone to blame for everything that happens. Surely there are times where there is someone to blame. There are times when people reap what they sow. But there are other times when just bad things happen. But if I create this tight link between sin and suffering, it can breed this kind of moral superiority. Well, well, it must be that someone did something wrong. And if that's you, you don't see your need for Jesus because you think, okay, well, I got my stuff together and I'm okay. Another question to ask is this, that when I see other people's failures, does it cause me to reflect on my own? When I see another person's failures, does it cause me to reflect on my own? When I, when I see someone gossiping, do I go, wow, how do I speak poorly about other people? When I, when I see someone captive to lust, I go, well, what fantasies have I been entertaining? When I see someone prideful and I'm annoyed by it, do I ever ask, why am I annoyed by their pridefulness? It's because they are stealing attention from me. <laughs> I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that people who love being the center of attention hate people who are the center of attention. <laughs> they just can't stand it, right? It, it, when I see sins in other people, does it make me more aware of my own sin in that area? Or does it just remind me that I'm superior, I've got it together, I'm okay? You know, this has been a, a sobering year just to see how many high-profile Christian leaders, uh, they're, they're just falling over like dominoes right now, man. And, and, and it's scary to see the level of corruption and sin and wickedness among people who, who profess to be people of God. And, and spiritual leaders. And you know, I'll be honest, it's easy for me to just write people off and get disgusted with the hypocrisy of that. But, but I think that, that I've, and I've been coming to, to see recently that that's just God's warning to me. Take heed lest you fall. Think, you, you're, you have flesh just like these people. Don't be so presumptuous. And, and so, so one kind of blindness that we have to be acutely aware of is moral superiority. The, the more I feel that I'm superior to other people, that I have things together, other people don't, the less interested I am in Jesus because I just don't feel like I need his forgiveness or his direction or his grace that much. That's the first blind spot. Second one is intellectual superiority. 
Moral superiority is I'm good, I've got it together. Intellectual superiority is I've already got this figured out. (laughs) I know the answer, you don't need to teach me. The Pharisees exhibit that and and it blinds them to Jesus. The man comes to the Pharisees and they begin this interrogation of him. So the Pharisees again asked him, verse 15, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. The crowd is divided about what's happened. The Pharisees are divided about what's happening. Everyone here is blind. No one's got things figured out. Some of the Pharisees go, this guy can't be from God. He's a lawbreaker. He doesn't follow the Sabbath. Uh, Other people, other Pharisees go, no, listen, if this guy is a sinner, how does he do such amazing things? How does he do such signs? In the Bible, that term sinner is often applied not just to, to people who sin, that's everybody, but specifically to people who are enemies of God, people who don't know God, people outside of God's covenant. So they're saying, how can this person not know God if he's, if he's doing these amazing things? Now, the, the Pharisees are having this argument. Here's the irony. These are the people who think they know the law best, and yet both of their arguments about Jesus, they're, they're really bad arguments, right? On the one hand, you have this first group who reject Jesus, and their, right, their premise is right. that Listen, if someone breaks God's law, then it doesn't matter if they do miracles or whatever. They, we shouldn't listen to that person. And, and that's right. That's, in fact, what Moses warns about in Deuteronomy 13. So they're right in their premise, right? If, if this person's a lawbreaker, we shouldn't listen to him. But what are they wrong about? Their conclusion. Jesus isn't breaking the Sabbath law. He's breaking their oral tradition and their overly fastidious interpretation of the law. So their argument's weak. But then the second group, who who seems to be a little more open to Jesus, their argument is weak too. They just say, look at all the amazing things he's doing. But the Bible is clear that that miracles are not some infallible guide to spiritual authority. There are plenty of people in Scripture who do amazing works, and yet it's clear that they are not on God's team. So in both cases, there's blindness. (laughs) These people struggle to, to even give biblical arguments for their positions. So on one, the premise is right, the conclusion is wrong. On the other one, the, the conclusion is right, Jesus really is from God, but their argument for why is kind of weak. So they're disagreeing, and so they go to the blind man and say, what do you think? Verse 17, they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. See, this man is convinced that Jesus is from God. And you can see that this man, who now has his physical eyes, is gaining a set of spiritual eyes. He's seeing more and more clearly who Jesus really is. He doesn't think that Jesus is a law breaker. He believes, his instinct is to believe that Jesus is sent from God. But at the same time that his spiritual eyes are opening, the religious leader's sight is growing dimmer. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? The the religious leaders, they're, they're still divided on this and they want to make sure they get the facts of the case right. And so they really need to verify, did this really happen? This doesn't, I don't think this happened. They don't believe the neighbors, they don't believe the man, so they go to the parents. The parents would be obviously the most authoritative about this. Was he blind from birth? Is he now healed? They say yes. But when they ask how did it happen, the parents are a little more muted. Here's how the parents answer. We know that this is our son, that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The parents agreed, yep, they confirm it, this is our son. 
He has been healed, but that's all they're willing to say. They punt back to the son. They say, he's of age. That means he was over 13, that he was able to provide legal testimony. It's clear here that the parents, they don't like being interrogated. They're afraid. Why is that? Well, because the religious leaders had already begun to expel people from the synagogues, Jewish places of worship, anyone who confessed Jesus. I think really anyone who who even appeared to be interested in Jesus was being cast out of, of synagogues. Now, this would later become a formal edict in the first century that anyone who confessed Jesus would be expelled from the synagogue. But here, it's a more informal arrangement. They're just already cracking down on Jews who have an interest in following Jesus and casting him out of their community. And that makes sense. I mean, we know from John, these people are already plotting to kill Jesus and, and, and they want to excommunicate anyone who appears to be on his side. And, and these parents aren't stupid. It, it seems they're intrigued by Jesus, but they don't want to give any hint that they, they might be interested in who he is or what he has to offer. And, and, and so they just say, well, talk to our son. That's all we're going to say. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner or I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. See, Pharisees have a problem on their hands. This guy really got healed, but they don't like Jesus. So they say, give glory to God, which is another way of saying, tell the truth. Tell the truth. You're lying. We already know Jesus is a sinner. He doesn't know God. He could not have done this. And now this guy's getting a little bolder. He says, you know what? All of your debates about the law, I'll I'll leave those to the theologians. The thing I know is that I couldn't see, and now I can. And Jesus did it. Uh, Now the, the Pharisees are just grasping at straws. Verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Maybe there's something they missed. Maybe there's some inconsistency that they can still find, but they just keep repeating themselves and these questions. And now this man realizes that, you know, these aren't impartial observers just trying to find the truth. They're they're desperate to make a case against Jesus, and they're looking for any inconsistency they can find. And the man's not playing the game. Now he's bold. He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Isn't that great? Y'all are really interested in Jesus. Why don't you just go follow him and figure what he's all about? And and now the Pharisees are angry. The gloves come off. Verse 28, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. This gets to the root issue. These men are angry because they assume they already know what God has said. We're disciples of Moses. God gave the law through Moses. They saw themselves as Moses' apprentices, his disciples. Their lives revolved around explaining, understanding, interpreting the law. And they know it. And they know Jesus is a lawbreaker. And so it can't be that Jesus is someone sent from God to do a miraculous works. See, they still don't believe that that Moses, as Jesus said back in John 5, was actually testifying about Jesus. They think that on the basis of Moses, they can reject Jesus. And and, and at this point, the man just sees through the veneer. these, These men are judges who they've already had a verdict. Jesus is guilty, and now they're just looking for evidence to prove it. And so the man says, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. These men know so little about Jesus, and yet the man saying, Jesus is someone you should should know about. Now, now this man's theological reasoning, again, it's not entirely right. There are plenty of false prophets and false messiahs and false wonder workers who do amazing things, and that doesn't prove they're from God. But, but this man, his instinct is right. 
to say, if you look at this person, aren't you interested in who he is? Is your assumption really that this person is not from God? In the Old Testament, only a few blind people get healed. And there is no one in the Old Testament who was blind as a congenital condition, born from birth, who is healed, and now Jesus has done that. See, Jesus is someone who the Pharisees should have been much more interested in because he's not just doing any signs, he's doing unprecedented signs, and he's doing the kinds of signs that God's Messiah was going to do. Isaiah 35 says this, that when God intervenes in the world through his Messiah and sends this Messiah, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Jesus is doing the kinds of things that the Messiah would do. He is meeting the qualifications. The blind man is drawn. He sees physically, and now he is seeing spiritually. But the Pharisees, they think they've got this whole thing figured out, and it proves they're blind. And so they answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. What a cruel thing to say. They, they, they treat this man just like the disciples did at the beginning. They go, well, your blindness must have been because of something you did and you would teach us. And there's, isn't that a crazy thing to say? I mean, this man just got healed. They're assuming God's punishment on you was blindness. Well, this man just got healed. What does God think of him now? And yet they're still treating him as someone punished by God in sin. They cast him out. They throw him away. They discard him from the local Jewish community. And this is the rub right here. Why did they reject Jesus? It's intellectual superiority. It's we already know it. We've already got it figured out. You cannot teach us. We cannot learn anything from you. And if your attitude toward knowledge, if your attitude toward Scripture is I've already got this figured out, then Jesus would say you're blind. You think you know, but you don't. And you won't look to Jesus for answers. And you won't come to him so that you can see. How do you know if you have this attitude of of sort of intellectual assuredness that either I already know everything, I already know how to figure this out. Here's a question I like to ask myself. Do, Do I go to Jesus to figure life out as a first resort or as a last resort. You know, you know the uh, Christians believe in the sufficiency of this book. And, and the sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean that, that God answers any question we might have about anything, but that everything necessary for life and godliness, for doing what is pleasing to the Lord, is contained in this book. And we need the word of Jesus to lead us. And so when you bump up against a problem in life, is your first instinct to run to Jesus and say, help me from your word to figure this out? Or is your first instinct to look basically anywhere else for an answer? Right? Because our priorities about every decision we make should be shaped by this book. And so, all right, you're having a conflict with your boss. Do do you look at how God defines work and the purposes of work and your purpose to glorify God through your work and and how you should treat people in authority at work? Do you start to filter your problem through those questions? Or you just stew on it or talk to other coworkers or try to figure out how to manipulate things to get your way? If you've got an issue in your marriage, not, nothing wrong with getting coaching or counseling, but fundamentally, do you have to ask, okay, what is the purpose of my marriage? What is Jesus doing through my marriage? And then what, how does that inform what I should do in this situation? 
For life decisions, do you go to God's word? If you think about, should we move out of the area or should we stay? I know a lot of people have been thinking about that. Do you just look, okay, what's the best house we can get in the best area with the best school and the best this and the best that and, and, and quality of life and, and nothing wrong with asking those questions? But do you filter the decision through some biblical priorities? Like what would God be calling us to there? What has God already called us to do? How can I serve there? What needs are there? Is there a church in that area that I could see myself connecting with? Or are there none? See, see there are, are, are biblical criteria for making decisions. Do you run to this word when you're stuck or do you ignore it? Because I would say that that is a blind spot. It's a way of not seeing our need for Jesus and you can have a kind of a pharisaical attitude even toward the word of God towards Jesus as a believer when we refuse to go to him for help, for guidance. The, the beautiful thing about just admitting, man, I don't have it all figured out. I need Jesus to see is that then we, we see everything clearly because we see him. That's how the passage ends. Remember, Jesus has been gone since the very beginning of the chapter. Finally, Jesus reappears at the end. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, having found him. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. Jesus goes and, and finds this man. And this man's spiritual perception of Jesus is, has been growing and growing. And now he really gets Jesus. Jesus says, do you believe that I am the son of man? Do, do you believe that I am that Messiah mentioned in Daniel 7, the son of man who will judge and save? And he says, who is he? And don't you love what Jesus says? You have seen him. In the same moment that this man finally sees Jesus with his physical eyes, he sees Jesus with the eyes of faith and he bows before his Lord and believes and, and, and worships Jesus. He acknowledges Jesus' greatness. He acknowledges that Jesus is the Lord. Now, does he see Jesus entirely? Does he, does he worship him as God in the flesh, the great I am? Or does he just believe that he's the Messiah well, it's not entirely clear, but it asks, invites us to ask the question, who is Jesus and, and do I see him clearly? And, and the beauty of the gospel is this, that when we realize that we're, we're blind, <laughs> that we can't see, that I don't have life figured out, I don't know how to make a decision in this area, it's in that moment where Jesus has us right where we're with him because we see what a merciful, good, gracious Savior he is. Who, who comes to bring us in when we've been cast out and to give us the light of life. That's the good news of the gospel, that when we're spiritually blind and we realize it, that's when we see our need for Jesus and run to him for sight. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, um, for coming from God to die for us, to rise for us. Lord, um, would we be quick to see that we cannot see? Would we be quick to question confidence in ourself? Would we be quick to um, question our own moral superiority? Lord, would we realize that, that apart from you, we are so blind. We need you to see. And we trust you, follow you, because in you we have the light of life. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you, Creekside, for uh, worshiping with us today. Hope to see you in person again soon, and have a blessed week. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise in vain its builders try to you who boast tomorrow's gain 